another exciting installment of University of Democrats. My name is Billy Calvin. I'm your president this semester. And I'm Daisy Goder. I'm your president this semester. And we are just so glad to see everyone here. I know it's very, very cold outside. It probably wasn't the most fun walking out to here. But those of you who came out, we're, we're very uh, glad that you did. We have a very exciting meeting planned. So, um, uh, I'm sure everyone has heard about this, but this morning, very bright and early, 8 o'clock in the morning, the Invest in Texas campaign got off to a very strong kickoff. And um, if you haven't heard, the Invest in Texas Coalition is a uh, you know, partnership between UDEM, student governments, and college councils, and lots of other student organizations, uh, all dedicated to representing students well at the Capitol. And we met earlier this morning, 8 o'clock, and we walked on down to the Capitol, and we sat in on the Senate Finance Committee hearing where they discussed the budget cuts to UT. And I think that it was just awesome to see so many people there decked out of Burnt Orange and representing our school. So thank you so much for the all. We hope it'll be the first of many times heading down to the Capitol this semester. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce someone who's very special to you, uh, Senator Kirk Watson, who previously served as the mayor of Austin before being elected to the Texas Senate in 2006. And He's always been a strong voice for students, for transportation, for energy, health care, and uh, he's a really great friend of you. So, we're all glad to see you here. Well, I appreciate that very much. I love the opportunity to talk to the University of Democrats tonight. Um, what I thought I would do is, I really want to hear what you want to talk about. So, what I thought I would do is just very briefly tell you what I think are going to be uh, two or three of the big, big issues that we're going to deal with, including, by the way, the budget uh, during this cycle. And I'll talk about that very briefly, but then I want to let you all ask me questions because my guess is that there are things on your mind about the legislative session that, uh, that I may not think to give you a speech on. So uh, let me start with the budget. The budget is a disaster. Um, it is a, but it's not totally a natural disaster. Uh, in my view, the budget is a disaster in large part because of a, uh, a long period of time now where it's been mismanaged. And uh, it probably had, had there not been rough economic times, probably the state could have uh, covered up uh, the debt and diversions and deception that's been going on for the last decade or so. But when you had a bad economic time, it kind of exposed the mismanagement. Let me just mention, you know, I mentioned debt, diversions, and deception. You know, the state brags all the time that uh, we're a state that's pay as you go, we balance our budget, not like Washington, D.C., which runs deficits. But the truth of the matter is that while we have to balance the budget, and we can't leave this session without a balanced budget, there's debt that the state has been taking on in different ways that has an impact on our budget. Like the, the best example I can give you is if you look at, since 2001 until now, if you look at the amount of money appropriated for debt service payments in our state, it's gone up 255%. So when you hear people, those in control of the budget, saying how they're frugal and they're not engaging in, in and those kinds of practices, it's just not true. Uh, primarily in the area of transportation is where that's occurred. So what has happened is, back at the first part of the decade, we were a pay-as-you-go state when it came to transportation. What it then occurred was some debt was, we, the voters uh, allowed for the payment of uh, the issuance of some debt, but it was dedicated money. In other words, you could issue the debt, but it had to be paid for from a dedicated source of funding. Well, that got changed again, and now it's money that is paid out of general revenue. So it's competing with higher education, public education, health and human services. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. And in fact, it's not solving the issues of things like transportation. At the end of this biennium, at the end of this biennium, the state of Texas will have zero dollars for any new construction, for new capacity on roadways in the state of Texas. Now, that's, that's absurd for a state that is growing as rapidly as our state is growing. Uh, but debt's a big problem. Uh, diversions are a big problem. Diversions of money. Accounting games that get played. I'll give you two examples of that. 
One is every time you put a gallon of gas in your car, you pay two gas tax fees. Uh, you pay a federal tax gas tax and you pay a state gas tax. The state gas tax is 20 cents a gallon. It, it feels like a sales tax because you're paying it when you buy something, but it's not really like a sales tax where it goes up with the price of the product or goes down with the price of the product. It's a flat 20 cents. And it's been that flat 20 cents since 1991. So even though the cost of road construction and everything has gone up, the gas tax hasn't. So that's part of the reason we have a problem with having enough funds to pay for road construction. Well, the gas tax goes into the motor fuels tax. It's got some other taxes other than just gasoline and fees that go into it. But that is a, a fund called Fund 6. That is what the people expect to pay for transportation. But over a billion dollars of biennium is diverted to pay for other things that the state doesn't have the money for. Things, and things that you might want. Things like the Department of Public Safety. But the point being that you can also argue that if you go decade, if you go uh, biennium after biennium, having to divert billions of dollars out of your motor fuels tax money to pay for other things, you have a structural problem with your budget. You don't have enough money to cover the things you want to cover. In addition, the state of Texas, uh, those in control of the budgeting process, they play a game. They say to the public, they say to the public, now we know you don't want any taxes or fees or any revenue sources, but really, what do you think about 911? Do you like 911? People say, oh yeah, I like 911. Say, what, what if we charged a small tax or fee that would be dedicated for the specific purpose of paying for 911, or trauma care, or helping poor people in the hot summer months cover their electric utility bill, things like that. And people say, well, I'm for that. How about parks? You like parks? Well, yeah, I like parks. How about we dedicate a portion of the sporting goods sales tax, we dedicate a portion of that for parks and wildlife? Yeah, I'm for that. So we've got piggy banks all over state government that are for specific dedicated purposes, but yet they get diverted. In 2003, in 2003, $1.2 billion, $1.2 billion of specific dedicated funds, what's called general revenue dedicated, was diverted to balance the budget. It wasn't appropriated for its specific dedicated purpose. 1.2 in 2003. At the end of this biennium, $3.7 billion. Actually, it'll end up probably being closer to $4 billion. But the safe number is $3.7 So it, it, it's, it's a scam. It's a broken, it's a $3.7 billion worth of broken promises to the people of Texas. And then there's deception. And the best example I can give you of that is that um, in 2006, the Texas Supreme Court, the all-Republican Texas Supreme Court, had declared our school finance system unconstitutional. And I won't go into all the legal parts of that. Bottom line is it was declared unconstitutional. So the governor called the legislature back in the session and said, we've got to fix the school finance system. And so what the legislature did is it said the first thing we need to do is we need to reduce local property taxes. There is no statewide property. So the only property taxes that could be reduced would be local ones. And by the way, the public needed a decrease in their property taxes. So there was a decrease in local property taxes. A decrease that amounted to $14.1 billion. Well, it was a great politician's trick. I'll reduce your taxes. Yay! I'm not going to stop the service, though, because you want that service. It was a great political game. So if you're not going to stop the service when you reduce the revenue, you've got to come up with more revenue. So they passed what was called the, the new business tax. Many people know it as the margins tax. They passed the new margins tax, they raised the cigarette tax, and they created what's called the liar's affidavit for used car sales. Because in the old days, what happened, you buy a used car, you might pay 10000 for it, You'd say you paid three and you pay sales tax on three instead of ten. Well, now you have to pay the blue book value based on this 2006 change in law. And when they did it, when they did that, 
they said it's only going to raise eight billion dollars. Well, I went to law school, so I didn't have to do math. But I can do fourteen minus eight. They created a structural deficit on the day they passed it. So they deceived the public. And here's how you know they knew they were deceiving the public. They also created a fund that had over $4 billion in it that they loftily refer to as the Property Tax Relief Fund. I called it the mattress money. It was money that they shoved in the mattress so that what they could do is in the next legislative session, when this deficit appeared, they could cover it up. Over $4 billion didn't go to any public schools, didn't go to any Texas grants, it didn't go to any health care in our state, didn't build a single lane mile of, of roadway. Instead, it was used to cover up a built-in structural deficit. And the worst news is that it hasn't even raised the $8 billion they said it would. I was put on a committee called the Margins Tax Advisory Committee, which was created in 2006. I, I wasn't elected. 2006 and didn't take office until 2007, but I was put on this committee in 2007, and we've looked at it, and it's never, at the rate it's going, I say never, at some point, what they keep saying is, well, we'll grow out of it, but over the next five years, it won't get the $5 billion, and that's what you see in the newspapers when the comptroller's person said it's creating a $10 billion problem, so that's what that's all about. Well, then what happened? Because they used the property tax relief fund that time to cover it up. What happened last session? Well, the Rick Perry bailout. He accepted a bailout from Washington, D.C. $12 billion of stimulus money was put into this to the budget. Now, a little over $6 billion of it was actually used to offset general revenue. And we can get into a number of them. But the bottom line is over $6 billion, and that was used. Well, folks, that money's gone. So now we're faced with a big budget problem that is in large part because of the deception and how we're dealing with how we deal, uh, dealt with that tax swap, a failed tax swap in 2006. So debt, diversion, and deception has led us to this problem. It's going to be an ugly, ugly process. It's going to require cuts. There's going to have to be cuts. But I say there also has to be significant reform. And so I've laid out a, what I call the honesty agenda. And the honesty agenda goes through a variety of things, we can talk more in detail about that, but we've already had some success. One of the first things we did is I attempted to change the Senate rules so that the public would have more opportunity to see what's in this budget. Because it's time for those who are in control of our budgeting process to be held accountable. And those that are in control are only going to be held accountable if the public knows what's going on uh, in the budget. And we, we, um, we actually got the rules changed. Uh, there's now something in the rules that have never been in the Senate rules that will require the very important document lay out for at least 48 hours so that the public, and by the way, the senators, will know what's in that document. 